Anatomy of a Blue Chip Market, the Prince of Andy Warhol, with my old friend Judd Tully. Um, I'm Jenny Gibbs, the Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation. And when I began my career many, many decades ago at Christie's, um, Judd was always uh, in the back of the auction room um, it, and hard to miss, always hard to miss. So very happy to have him here. Um, I'm going to read you his actual bio. Um, Judd Tully was born in Chicago and educated at American University in D.C. His career in journalism began as a cub reporter with the 70s underground paper, The Berkeley Barb, where he covered the politically charged trials of the Soledad brothers, George Jackson and Angela Davis in San Francisco and Marin County. For over two decades, he was editor at large of Art and Auction magazine. His journalism and art criticism has appeared in Flash Art, Art News, The Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, and The Art Newspaper, as well as his blog, blog JudTully.net. Uh, Judd has been frequently interviewed on BBC Radio, CNN, MSNBC, as well as made cameo appearances in a number of documentary films that chronicle the rise and fall, and hopefully rise, uh, of the art market and scandals associated with it, including the CNBC's American Greed, the Art of the Steel, and Driven to Abstraction, the expose of the $80 million art forgery at the once venerated Nodler Gallery. I hate to end on that, um, but with that, <laughs> I'm happy to turn over the mic to my old friend, Judd. <clears throat> Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, so uh, this is going to be a hard act to follow after Derek Adams, but it's uh, I'm just kind of reading as opposed to, uh, but if anybody has any questions later, that would be fine. Um, so let's see. Ah, okay. So this is the man, Andy Warhol. And uh, for starters, uh, 51 prints by Andy Warhol have sold for over a million dollars at auction, at least according to the price database Artnet, which has tracked, get this number, 27,558 auction lots of his prints since 1986. And um, by comparison, but I'm not comparing the two, uh, 49 prints by Picasso have sold for over a million dollars. Um, <clears throat> looking back, um, an early example at auction uh, of Warhol now, not Picasso, was a single 44 by 29 inch print of Mitt Mick Jagger from 1975 from the portfolio of 10 screen prints that sold for $935 against an estimate of $700 to $900 at Christie's East in November 1986. And Christie's East is long gone as well as Mr. Warhol, but that's an interesting marker in terms of, and it was just, um, it was one of those images of uh, Mick. Um, and I'm showing throughout the portfolios as opposed to mostly individual prints of Warhol. Um, so coming forward a bit, another single print from that same edition went for 157,500 at Phillips edition sale in New York just on Thursday that took in a house record total prints, uh, 6.3 million for the 358 lots that sold. In Warhol's stunningly prolific mix of prints, the top gun is not so surprisingly Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn, from 1967 that fetched $4,980,000 at Christie's New York last May against an estimate of 1.5 to 2.5 million. It hails from an edition size of 250 and each of the 10 prints in various colors measures 36 by 36 inches. That size seems to be a favorite size for Warhol prints. Uh, you can do the simple math and figure that each print in that set went for close to $500,000 a piece, including fees. And you have to apologize, I've photographed, uh, well, 
took a screenshot, so to speak, of a book, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And uh, still with this one, signed and stamped in pencil and numbered with a rubber stamp on the verso is number 108 over 250. There are also 26 artist proofs signed and lettered A to Z on the verso. Um, there was nothing special or at least noted in the catalog description in terms of provenance or other interesting tidbits that might have juiced the price higher. So the information regarding print size and the like during this talk and for the rest of the examples that will be cited today hail from the authoritative and Bible-like first edition from 1985 of the Andy Warhol Prince catalog resume edited by Freda Feldman and Jorg Schellman, and with essays by the late curator and bon vivant Henry Geldzahler, as well as critic biographer Roberta Bernstein, and as well as an interview with Rupert Jason Smith, uh, who was... Uh, he died in 1989, the longtime Warhol printer, starting from 1977 with the first uh, work of uh, his called Hammer and Sickle portfolio up to Moonwalk in 1987, the year of Warhol's death. And uh, the publication, and what I'm showing you actually is probably a later edition uh, um, is critical to the understanding of this part of Warhol's oeuvre and is still available on sites like Amazon. As noted curator Donna DeSalvo described Warhol's innovative medium in the 2003 edition, I'm um, quoting her, she's the uh, former, one of the chief curators or at the Whitney and Tate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, through his conceptualization of the printing process, Warhol transformed that process into his metaphor for America, its capitalism, its abundance, its industry, and most important, its simultaneous and contradictory desire for innovation and uniformity. Marcel Duchamp meets Norman Rockwell meets cable vision. So you can tell the reference to cable vision, this was written a while ago. Um, anyway, and uh, you can see, uh, I can see it sort of. Uh, these are just from the book, some black and white photos of Warhol at work. Uh, on the top left, he's with his publisher, Ronald Feldman. Um, upper right, Warhol shooting Uncle Sam with his Polaroid. And there is uh, the artist with a zebra print from Endangered Species, and then uh, studio assistants screen printing. <clears throat> Surprisingly, or at least to me, uh, the second highest Warhol print price at auction lands with the much later Endangered Species portfolio from 1983 and hailing from an otherwise unidentified Japanese collection that made uh, 2.9 million pounds or just over 4 million against an estimate of 350 to 550,000 pounds at Sotheby's London in March 2021. It was number 125 over an edition size of 150 with each of the 10 prints ranging from an African elephant to a Siberian tiger measuring 38 by 38 inches you can also add in another 30 artist proofs, five printers proofs, five exhibition proofs, and uh, three more reserved for collaborators in the process. They're referred to as HC, but I won't pronounce it in French because it'll sound lousy. <clears throat> During a recent phone interview I had with Kerry Leibowitz, the deputy chairman and worldwide co-head of editions at Philips, as well as a visual artist observed. You can also find a lot of the late 70s going into the 80s work that had not been in as high regard of earlier stuff has a whole new market and that whole new international group of buyers right now an endangered species set, as we just noted, can make the same price as a Maryland set. 
Somebody might feel, he notes, the Maryland is too campy or old fashioned for them. And they like the animals and they like the colors of the later stuff. Beyond that, though conceived and executed in 1983, the series today is on the cutting edge of mounting concern with global warming and the disappearance or danger list of so many species. Leibowitz characterizes that whole new generation of collectors in the 30 to 60 age bracket and who don't know, quote, the whole backstory of Warhol. For that reason, or it seems, formerly underappreciated series like Space Fruit Still Lifes from 1979 have shot up in price or in higher demand at auction. And I believe these are cantaloupes. This is one of the like odder <laughs> to me, um, but great uh, edition uh, works. Um, the next three prices in the database are also for the 10 part Maryland portfolios followed by flowers from 1970. I think we're looking at that number 57 of 250 that made 2.1 million euros or about $2.5 million against an estimate of 800,000 euros to a million euros at an auction house in Cologne, Germany. Uh, when was that? Um, anyway, it hailed from the legendary Helga and Walther Laus collection in Creffield, and no doubt its celebrated provenance boosted its market desirability. Next in line, price-wise, carries another notable provenance tagline with Mao from 1972. This is number one from an edition of 50, plus 50 artist proofs that made 1.6 million pounds or about 2.5 million dollars at Sotheby's London back in May 2012. It was sold by the estate of global playboy photographer, industrialist, and collector Gunter Sachs. The Mao portfolio from Castelli Graphics and Multiples marks an important variant in Warhol's oeuvre as Leibowitz explained, in that for the first time, the artist used freehand on the screen. So you've got the brushwork, some black lines and dialogue with the screen image of Mao, as well as using a layer of varnish. It's unusual since as Leibowitz states of Warhol, quote, he's a machine, he doesn't touch things. <clears throat> ah. So flicking back, for a moment to the artist's prime pop art years, Campbell's Soup 1 from 1968, with each print measuring 35 by 23 inches, and number 129 for an edition of 250, sold for just over a million pounds or $1.44 million against an estimate of 300 to 500,000 pounds at Phillips London in June 2021. Whether early or late, Warhol's print uh, oeuvre remains the gold standard, like another 80s standout, the Myths portfolio, with number 17 over 30 trial proofs realized a little over, well, 1.1 million against an estimate of 500 to 800,000 at Christie's New York back in November 2014. All of the 10 American as apple pie images, ranging from Howdy Doody to Superman, but not Dracula, uh, who's up there, are sprinkled, so to speak, with diamond dust. Completed in the same decade, and which would be 1985, and just two years before Warhol's death at age 57, a single print of Queen Elizabeth II from the reigning Queen's portfolio from 1985 and measuring 39.4 by 31.5 inches soared to 554,000 pounds, that's $641,000, against an estimate of 150 to 250,000 pounds at Sotheby's London 
uh, this last September, September 14th, 2022. Lucky for Sotheby's and for the seller who acquired the print in the 80s, Queen Elizabeth passed away on the 8th of September at Balmoral Castle, making that sale a kind of lofty homage. Another Queen Elizabeth II print from that series made 352,500 against an estimate of 200 to 300,000 at Phillips here in New York on Thursday, underscoring the point that timing is pretty much everything. The portfolio of 16 screen prints in an edition of 40 includes the lesser known visages of Queen Mar Margrethe the second of Denmark, Queen Beatrice of the Netherlands, and Queen Tombi Twala of Swaziland. As Leibowitz observed of Queen Elizabeth, she's a little bit like Marilyn Monroe, so iconic. By contrast, a single print of the Queen of Swaziland may garner $12,000 today, and that of the Queen of the Netherlands in the region of 50,000. Another late in career edition, and I might add that um, I could have talked about any other number of editions, images, dates of Warhol, but he was so prolific that I've kind of just picked more than a handful, but some of them. <clears throat> um, Another late in career edition adds, also from 1985, including the screen gem likes of James Dean and Ronald Reagan, and storied brands such as Chanel No. 5 and the old bygone Apple logo exude Warhol's ode to capitalism. <clears throat> A set of 10 with each sheet measuring 38 by 38 inches from the <coughs> trial proofs number 13 out of 30 sold for a little over $1 million against an estimate of 500 to 800,000 at Christie's New York back in November 2014. Going back once more to the Maryland Prince of 1967, some folks might wonder how in the heck did, quote, this is the title of the Warhol, shot Sage Blue Maryland from 1964 and scaled at 40 by 40 inches in acrylic and silk screen ink on linen fetch a record shattering $195 million at Christie's in New York last May? the highest price ever achieved for an American artist. Uh, how do you make sense of that enormous gap between linen and paper since the highest price recorded for a single Maryland print was $378,000 uh, that sold uh, in October, 2021 at Phillips, New York. Leaving that looming question in part, the, leaving the answer of that looming question in part to Kerry Leibowitz, the specialist said, quote, right now the difference is really just what collectors have made of it. The painting is a painting, a print is a print. You could say a painting has its own unique history and its own unique provenance and the prints come out in an edition of 250. So they're definitely a multiple. But if you're breaking it down by a screen making process, there isn't much of a difference. So it's really more about the metaphysical aspect of the object itself. Leibowitz also brought up an interesting but long forgotten fact of how some museums in the 1960s used to categorize and place Warhol works in their print departments because they were all screen printed. Obviously that has changed. In closing, if you're looking for art historical importance in any of Warhol's series, 
The trophy, in my opinion, would go to Warhol's multicolored uh, electric chair. I should show it to you from 1971, published by Bruno Bischofberger in Zurich in an edition of 250. At Christie's New York last May, a complete set of 10 sold for $466,000 against an estimate of 200 to 300,000. And that's a 10th of the price of a top Maryland portfolio and considerably larger image-wise at 35 and a half by 48 inches. Then again, not many people would want those disturbing and rather terrifying images hanging on their dining room wall. Thank you. Oh, thanks. For someone who has a, a work purportedly by Warhol, who may have sent it to the Warhol Foundation for Authentication before it disbanded. Uh-oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, and if there was questions concerning that work, what is the place where one can go to get a sense of where the value for that work is because i understand that there's there's no you know it's not going to be valued at the same level as something that has been authenticated hmm. but i think there's still people out there who would be interested in it and i'm just curious as sure to no that's a good question i mean you and you could really there are a number of artists because of all the litigation that came up against the Warhol Foundation and the authentication committee when it was operating um, by spurned owners, um, including one uh, American who lives in London whose um, Warhol was uh, later became referred to as double denied. Um, you know, it depends on the work, what kind of information there is about the sale, where it was bought, when it was bought. Um, right now, um, there, oh, the other point I was going to make about, uh, the Warhol Foundation, which is still in operation and gives out millions of dollars every year to artists, organizations, they ended the authentication committee because it cost, um, I think it was $7 million in legal fees to defend that last case that I referred to. And they simply got tired of spending money on legal fees. And that was in 2012, I believe. And in the next following year, the uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat estate, uh, the Roy Lichtenstein estate and foundation, and uh, Keith Herring Foundation ended their authentication services for those exact same reasons. So uh, I know um, I wrote about it for the art newspaper I don't know, a month or two ago, but there is a, uh, he's now based in Santa Fe. He was based in San Francisco. Um, um, I'll think of his name in a second. Uh, but anyway, he is now authenticating works by the artists that I just mentioned. And they're coming up, not at major auction houses, but they're coming up uh, there's one I know in um, Scottsdale, Arizona, Larson uh, auctions or Ar Larson galleries. And they've, well, they sold, they tried to sell one of Alice Cooper's electric chair paintings. It didn't, it didn't sell. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a big hole in the whole, you know, you could take something to, to Sotheby's or Christie's or Phillips or, you know, Bonham's, uh, Swan, and they would look at it 
and they would say whatever. It would depend if it would match. If anybody else has had any experience with that, love to hear about it. But um, yeah, the the gentleman's name is is um, uh, Richard Polsky, P O L S K Y. So, a qu question for you: as a teacher, lecturer, writer, professor, a perspective on Warhol. So if we asked you to look at the work of Lichtenstein, Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, Ellsworth Kelly, Frank Stella, Jim Dine, Rosenquist, and Warhol, and that whole time frame, how would you, what, where does he fit in with all of them? Are they all equal? Is he better, any of them better, worse? How would you look at that question about all those artists of that time and place? And mm -hmm. I have a second question after that. Oh, uh, well, I, I would, I mean, I would say, um, not that I'm a professor, but I would say that, you know, at least on the level of all those artists you mentioned, and conceivably, in a certain way, beyond all of those artists, given, you know, his radical approach, both to making art, producing art, selling art, and um, his lifestyle, his whole um, obsession with daily, you know, saving all the kind of ticket coupons and restaurant chips. And actually, I was thinking about this just recently. There's an Edward Hopper retrospective going on now at the Whitney. And they have, apparently, they have are showing a bunch of his... Um, like ticket stubs from sh Broadway shows he and his wife went to. Uh, but getting back to Warhol, yeah, he's a, you know, um, I mean, you know, it's like 20th century Picasso, Warhol. I mean, a lot of people would take, uh, you know, offense at that comparison. Um, but, um, oh, and the other part I would just mention, you could not script a more amazing life of someone, you know, he was shot, he almost died. Um, the factory, you know, Bob Dylan, every, you know, David Bowie, I mean, every person famous went through the factory or hung out. And um, yeah, and then this other, I don't know if you saw the, uh, that, I think it was a six part series on HBO that showed a whole other side of his gay, like that he wasn't the, you know, asexual person that he'd like to promote. It's interesting, just as a comment, um, as I mentioned, I've done the catalog raisonnés for a lot of those big folks and Rick Axum, and I'm giving you the book he did for me on that. When I asked him, and I said, you know, Rick, when we do the Lichtenstein show, and I say, you know, the greatest artist, the second half of the 20th century, and then we do Jasper Johns, I'd say the same thing. And then, you know, uh, with Ellsworth Kelly and so forth, I said, so tell me, what do you think, Rick? He said, you know, Jordan, in his opinion, and he's one of the foremost writers, he said, you really can't compare and say that Rauschenberg or Jasper Johns or Ellsworth Kelly or Frank Stiller or Warhol or Lichtenstein, one was better than the other. It's just that Warhol rises above because it's so much more accessible for the public in terms of his images and his themes. Mm. Anyway, second question for you with your perspective of having been an observer of these times. We have such phenomenal artists working today, like the Derek Adams we just heard, that younger, you know, we'll see where his career all goes and others today. But in looking back, uh, might someone suggest that there was a golden time in American artists of those artists that came about in the late forties through the, well, Frank Stella's still alive, whatever, but uh, that, that, that was a unique kind of period of such amazing geniuses or will we look back and say they were, but also the folks of the 2020s, thirties, forties, and fifties were the ones that rose above were just as good. Or was there something unique about that time and place of post-World War II America, the materialism, consumerism, TVs, and so forth that just happened genetically to have mm. some phenomenal artists that all rose to such amazing prominence. 
Um, wait, I missed the question, though. The question was, did that period of time in America, hmm. from post-World War II through the 2000, create a group of art, were a group of artists working that were that that will hardly be replaced again in time. And amazing is some of the artists today working yeah. that maybe they won't yeah. in 50 years have risen to the level of prominence yeah. those artists happen to rise up to. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, <clears throat> it's so hard to tell now with, you know, the web and NFTs and everything going on that, you know, it's a much wider, broader world. Um, I mean, to me, a lot of the great artists that came out of what you're talking about post-war huddled or lived in New York City at a time where you were in an exciting city, you could afford, you know, to have a loft downtown or some cold water flat you could have a part-time job. You could develop as an artist at your own pace over a long period of time and have other people close around you. And I don't think that exists anymore. So maybe that has something to do with it. If you think of all those, those artists you mentioned or, or um, the um, um, fraternity amongst artists uh, I think is harder today to, um, you know, come up with, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, it's the, you know, the people that live in lofts now um, are not, for the most part, aren't artists unless they got them in the seventies or became real estate developers in the eighties. Sorry. Sure. Hi, wonderful talk. Um, you, the lady who asked earlier about authentication, mm -hmm. I know, yeah. Oh, I just wanted, you asked if anyone had experience with this. Well, I, I'm actually very interested in this kind of thing because I've bought a few things at auction and I've experienced every kind of mishap you can imagine. I've always gotten my money back because I'm like a dog with a bone. But um, I have a tiny little Warhol drawing that has the double stamp. But in my research, what I found is even the fakers can fake the double stamp. So you'll actually, if you go and research, you'll see different variations of the double stamp. So that's, that's not necessarily any kind of indication. Um, and also there's the uniform commercial code, um, which mm. kind of governs anything you buy so that an art net is one place that spells it out uh, explicitly. They say if the, the item is found to be not authentic, or not as described, um, then you get all your money back. And so I've gotten my money back a couple of times from them. You know, when it says full margins, but it's trimmed, for example. Okay, but huh. it seems to me, and I wonder if your opinion on this, is that, you know, some auction houses are more dil do dil diligence than others. And I know the ones who don't do as much, but what they do is fall back on the commercial code. So they might do no, very little authentication, and you buy it, but it's up to you to then go and do your research. And then if you discover that it's not authentic, you can come back and say, give me my money back. And then they'll probably go, no problem, here's your money back. And it seems like Christie's, people like that, the big names, they are seen to do more. So it's almost like by saying it has the stamps, whatever, I got it from Christie's and here it is online. Christie's almost becomes a de facto part of authentication. That's great news for Christie's or Sotheby's. Would you say that would be the case? It's almost like they get the... Well, I, I know that, that Christie's at one point, I don't know if they're mm -hmm. still doing it, but when Amy Capalazzo was there mm -hmm. and head of whatever, post-war, 20th century, whatever, um, they had made a deal with the Warhol Foundation. Yeah. Uh, they had a big series of sales of lesser Warhol works, and they became, in a way, the de facto <coughs> authenticators. But... Um, you mentioned uh, being able to fake stamps. I mean, I would say in the print world, and by no means I'm not at all an expert, but given the state of technology today, 
faking prints, whether it's Warhol or, you know, Joe Schmo, it's, um, it's much harder to tell given the, if it's done carefully and given the paper, given the inks, everything, it's uh, pretty challenging. Yeah, there's a huge industry in China, as you know, that can make. Yeah, sure. And that famous S7 Atlas, you know, the, the famous collector in yeah. Chicago, they gave him a, when he gave the Maryland to whatever museum it was, they gave him a, uh, a, a replica. And he said it was so good, it was right down to the exact brush stroke. And he said, I'm happy with my replica, you know, yeah. on the wall. Yeah. But, um, wow. They, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But they can also fake um, the blind stamp and that sort of thing. And it's not just the, the big ones. There's um, a place on uh, uh, a gallery on the web that makes a huge amount of money uh, with fake uh, Warhols and Lichtensteins. And they sell them for three or $400. People buy them. And if you think about that's a good business for them because they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And no one basically wants to shut them down. So, well, I, yeah. I think Warhol wouldn't mind. Really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he let um, – um, it's – Ellen Sturdivant. Sturdivant not, and Sunday Be Morning. And, yeah, right. and gave permission yeah. for her to make copies and of her, of her paintings. Yeah. And other artists, too. Yeah. Well, thank permission. you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, given the current discussion about attribution revolving around the Prince image, how, how do you think that will affect the market. I heard on one extreme people saying, oh, that'll mean that many public institutions will be afraid to show certain works. Um, but on the other hand, uh, uh, the flip side of that is I hear people saying, well, that will only make them more coveted because they're somehow that much more elusive or special. What, what do you think about? What do I think in terms of um up <laughs> yeah. how the um, question of um, attribution mm -hmm. and who actually can show Warhol pieces will do to the market. Right. <clears throat> well, it really all comes down to, I mean, I'm not talking really about multiples, but it, well, it all comes down to the provenance, where it comes from. You know, if there's no, like that, um, Jenny made a reference to uh, uh, a documentary about the Nodler scandal driven to abstraction by Daria Price. And Nodler was selling works by Mark Rothko, Robert Motherwell, that had literally no history other than the ones that they invented about it. In other words, it had no exhibition history. So if you think about a Rothko, that would be highly unlikely unless it had been in his studio and it was there when after his death and someone documented it. So I think the main thing is just the information. But then again, there have been scammers, world-class scammers. This one particular guy in England, he donated money to the Tate and because of that, uh, he was given privileged access to their library and archives. And he went in and would go to a catalog that Giacometti had a show in 1950 at XYZ Gallery in London. He would take that page and then create a fake provenance. And he sold many, many works to very sophisticated collectors, dealers, et cetera. So it's like buyer beware, 